Hello, good evening, and welcome to Daring to Dig, Women in Paleontology. I'm your host, Nancy Coddington, Director of Science Content for WSKG Public Media. We have a special event planned for you tonight, including a panel of eminent women paleontologists who will share their careers, experiences, challenges, and inspiration for the next generation of girls pursuing careers in science and paleontology. This panel is a complement to the exhibit Daring to Dig Women in American Paleontology on display at the Museum of the Earth in Ithaca, New York. And that is up until December of this year, 2021. And it's also available online at daringtodig.org. We have participants from all over the country and the world attending our events, and we would love to hear where you're from. So please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you're tuning in from. We also are going to encourage you to ask questions to our guest speakers throughout tonight's talk using the chat feature. If you don't see the chat box on your end and you're watching us on YouTube, you're in full screen mode. To exit full screen mode, click the icon at the bottom right of your screen and the chat should appear on the side. If you are tuning and watching us on Zoom this evening, use the Q&A feature to uh, ask your questions, but please also use the chat to share information with each other and also where you're tuning in from. We will do our best to get to all of your questions and as you're asking them, we are uh, collecting them and keeping them in, an, in a place. So don't worry, we will we'll try to get to them. So as we are getting started tonight, I would like to introduce the Executive Director of the Paleontological Research Institution, Dr. Warren Allman. Welcome. Hi, Nancy. Thanks for having us all tonight. Um, so I don't want to take uh, anybody's time to, from our guests tonight. I just want to say a, a little bit about um, the exhibit that you, that you mentioned. Um, we got started with this project about eight years ago when we decided to kind of explore uh, the general topic of women in American paleontology. And the reason we did that is because our institution actually was founded by uh, a man uh, as, as, as was customary in 1932, but he was a Cornell professor who uh, had a great interest in educating women in paleontology. And uh, he passed off the leadership of our institution to one of his graduate students who was a woman. And so we've always felt like uh, the Paleontological Research Institution has um, uh, an interest in the role of women in, in this discipline. And so we started this project uh, about eight years ago and uh, started to build it kind of bit by bit. And it just happened to come to fruition during the pandemic. And so we launched this temporary exhibit, which you mentioned and uh, which will end, uh, which will close at the end of December. But the, uh, or the online exhibit will live on indefinitely and it includes not just a lot of content about uh, uh, particular women, but it includes an archive, a video archive of uh, more than 40 women's stories. And we'll continue to add to that archive. And so I hope uh, people viewing tonight will uh, look at the website and continue to come back to it because we'll be adding content going forward celebrating the role of women in modern uh, American paleontology, which is really a success story. And um, women have uh, achieved a, a, a substantial role in modern American paleontology. And that's part of the story that we wanted to tell here. Um, and you've brought together a, a group of just really outstanding uh, women paleontologists tonight. And there's nothing that I could say that would add uh, anything to what they're going to say. So I will shut up now and Thank you again for having us tonight. Well, thank you, Dr. Ullman, and everyone at the Museum of the Earth for partnering with WSK to hold this event because it definitely is important, you know, talking about women and their careers in STEM. The field of paleontology has been greatly shaped by women, as Dr. Ullman was telling us, despite encountering resistance at every level required for success in the profession. The work of achieving equity in paleontology is still ongoing, but in the 21st century, paleontology is becoming a more welcoming science for everyone, regardless of sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, class, or ability. 
Tonight's panel consists of four women paleontologists in varying degrees of study from across the United States. Dr. Elizabeth Hermson is a paleobotanist. She studies fossil plants with a focus on their structure, classification, and evolutionary relationships. She has done paleontological fieldwork in both North and South America and has studied fossils spanning time periods from the Middle Triassic to the Neogene. She received her PhD from Cornell University and was an assistant professor at Ohio University. And she's now a research scientist at the Paleontological Research Institution in Ithaca, New York. Liz also contributes to projects in science communication, such as the Daring to Dig Women in American Paleontology exhibit and online open access digital encyclopedia of ancient life. Welcome. Dr. Linda Ivney studies the chemistry of fossil seashells to learn about the ancient animals that made them and the environments in which those animals lived. She is particularly interested in times in the past when Earth's climate was much warmer and her work has taken her to places near and far, including the US Gulf Coast, Antarctica and Australia. She's been interested in geology and paleontology her entire life. Linda went to Harvard University for her PhD and was later a fellow at the University of Michigan. She is currently a professor and associate chair of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Syracuse University. Dr. Christy Visaji studies the ecology of ancient marine environments, especially through fossil snails. And she's passionate about sharing her love of science as an educator, paleontologist, and mentor to students. Her field work has taken her to locations across the US and the Bahamas, Belize, Brazil, and Argentina. Christy received her PhD at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, and is currently undergraduate program director in geosciences at Georgia State University. Dr. Fazaji has been a leader with numerous science education organizations, is an advocate for diversity in the geosciences, and has received numerous awards for her teaching. Dr. Phoebe Cohen studies ancient single-celled microscopic organisms that lived before animals evolved. She uses microscopes, chemistry, and geology to figure out what very ancient organisms and their environments were like and how they've changed through time. Her field work has taken her to many remote sites around the world. Her first job after college was at the Paleontological Research Institution in Ithaca, New York, where she decided to become a paleontologist. Phoebe received her PhD from Harvard University in 2010 and is currently an associate professor of geosciences at Williams College in Massachusetts. She is very involved in diversity and inclusion work in the geoscientists. Welcome, panelists. Hello. <laughs> Good evening. Thanks so much for having us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us tonight. We are very excited to, to have you. So we are going to jump right into uh, some of our questions and get going. Also, I want to remind our audience to please ask questions in the chat features where you are viewing us so we can ask our panel tonight. So Dr. Hermson, we're gonna start with you. Can you start off telling us, you know, what is the difference between being a paleontologist and an archeologist? Right, so um, paleontologists study ancient life or, or fossils that represent ancient life. So we often think of paleontologists as studying dinosaurs, but really paleontologists can study fossils of any sort of organism. Uh, so some of us here tonight work on invertebrates or single-celled organisms. I myself work on plants. Fossils can also be traces of past life, so things like footprints or feeding traces. Archaeologists deal more with um, evidence of past human civilizations or the way uh, humans used to live in the past. Typically, the things that paleontologists are studying are very old. They can be hundreds of millions of years old, tens of millions of years old, but some paleontologists work on things that are relatively young. Archaeologists often work on things that are younger than paleontologists, but there's some overlap there as well. 
Thank you. That was a that was a great explanation. Um, Dr. Linda Ivany, did you always know that you wanted to go into a science career? Yeah, for me, I was pretty much uh, hooked right from the beginning. Um, I can't even remember a time when I was not interested in geology and in paleontology in particular. So for me, maybe that's a little bit unusual. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been pretty much the whole way through. Um, and I think a lot of people that are really passionate about this, um, many of us actually did start really, really early on. But then there's, you know, there's a whole other set of folks that were really exposed to it in school at some point, maybe in high school or in college for the first time. And boy, when, when you get the bug, you know it, you know, and you're going to be passionate about it. And if you're passionate about it, you're going to do well in it. Thank you. I'm going to toss that same question to Dr. Phoebe Cohen. You know, were you always, did you always want to go into the science careers or when did you first realize that that was your passion? Yeah, I was a little bit different than Linda. I was always very into science and nature as a kid, but I also had a lot of other interests. Um, I love photography. I loved writing. I loved history. Uh, and so it wasn't really until I got to college and then even afterwards that I really focused my interests on paleontology and the area of paleontology that I work on today. And it was because um, I was really interested in big questions, like how the world got to be the way it is today. And paleontology was a way for me to try to answer those questions. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Visaji, who inspired you to pursue a career in STEM? So I was always interested in science careers. Uh, I didn't plan on becoming a paleontologist, but I did find a fossil when I was five and I uh, took it to a museum. I met real paleontologists when I was very young and my family grew up fossil collecting as a hobby. So I don't think there was necessarily one person but I think that there were multiple people along the way from those paleontologists I met when I was really young who encouraged my passion to the mentors that I had in my classes in school who continued to um, encourage me in, in that way. So I don't think I have one single answer, but um, many people who were supportive along the years. Yeah, it tends to be multifaceted, right, where you have a, a lot of support or people that, that spark that interest. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Hermson, I'm going to ask you that same question. You know, who inspired you to pursue a career in paleontology? Um, you know, paleontology is something that I've been interested in since I was very young. So I don't know if there was a particular inspiration um, that kind of pushed me in that direction. It's just something, like I said, that I've been interested in for a very long time, and um, I decided to continue pursuing as I got older. Okay, thank you. Great. So I'm going to toss this out to the entire group. Um, what do you think are some of the best resources for someone who wants to learn about paleontology? Well, I'm going to put it Atlas of Ancient for, Life. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. I think we're all going to say the same thing, which is the project that Liz mentioned that was mentioned in Liz's bio, um, which is an amazing uh, online uh, encyclopedia and textbook of paleontology that, well, Liz can tell you more because she actually writes it. But I use it in my classes for teaching all the time. It's a wonderful resource. Dr. Hermson, do you want to elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, I can elaborate on it a little bit. So uh, Digital Atlas of Ancient Life is sort of the name for a project that has a series of components. So there are the digital atlases. Um, I think there are four of them now with that, that show, uh, I guess, pictures of fossils from different regions of the United States in different time periods. So for instance, there's a Neogene Atlas, to the Southeastern United States. There's an atlas of the Ordovician that I think covers Ohio and Kentucky. So that's interesting. Maybe if you're out looking for fossils in these areas and you want to identify um, what you're looking for, there's the Digital Encyclopedia of Ancient Life. Um, this involves multiple paleontologists, not just me, but I'm working on the, the plant sections of this. It's more of an online textbook. So it's set up to help you learn about different groups of organisms and their biology and also their fossil record. And then there's also a section on virtual collections. So these are 3D models of fossils and um, you can actually go in and manipulate them, turn them around in space on your computer and look at them 
And some of them also have labels telling you the different structures on the fossils you're looking at. Um, so it's kind of set up as a, an overarching teaching resource that a lot of people, maybe from the amateur level to um, college students can get a lot out of in terms of learning about paleontology. That sounds like a great resource and we will get the link for that and put that in the chat during our talk this evening. I really like how you can manipulate and move the pieces around to get a better, a better look at them. That's really fascinating. Uh, we do have an audience question. Um, so do you have any advice for women who are looking to get into paleontology? Um, Dr. Ivney, do you want to start with that one? Sure. I, I suppose it sort of depends on, uh, you know, what, what level you're at right now, if you're still in school, at high school, or if you're in college at this point. Um, so in terms of, you know, getting into paleontology, boy, um, you know, if you're still in school, take some classes. Um, if you're not in school, go outside and look around and observe nature. I think that's one of the more important things you can do. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just in general, I guess you would, it would tend to sort of depend on where you're at. Um, go to museums. Museums are great resources to try and, and, and learn what's going on these days. And uh, oftentimes there's you know, short courses and such you can do there. Talk to paleontologists there and make some connections. Um, so it really depends on where, where you're at, what stage you're at. You can, we can elaborate more on that if, you know, if there's more detail. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, Gigi asked that question. So if you can share with us um, what more specifics you're looking for in the chat, we can help to hone in with that. Um, Dr. Cohen, can you add um, some additional advice? Sure. I think, um, you know, I, I teach at the college level, so I often get students who come in as first year students who are really interested in paleontology. And so, like Linda said, um, encourage folks to take courses, not just in paleontology, but in geology and biology and evolution um, and find a mentor. I think finding a mentor um, and that doesn't necessarily have to be a professor. It could be someone at a museum. It could be a graduate student if you're at a university, um, but someone that you can connect with and who um, is maybe a little bit ahead of where you are in terms of your schooling, who can give you a sense of what um, what their experiences are like, what their careers have been like. And I think, you know, attending events like this is also a, a great way to learn a little bit more about what it's like to be a paleontologist and whether or not something that you want to try to pursue. Great, thank you. And I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Fasaji uh, to comment on that same question. Any advice for women uh, who are looking to go into the field of paleontology? Sure. So uh, the Paleontological Research Institution, who is helping host this event, is they actually have a website that talks about, so you want to be a paleontologist, where they tell you, you know, oh, take science and math classes or go explore outdoors and all these things that everybody's mentioned. So I would definitely recommend checking that out. If you uh, go to museums or you have university nearby or check out and see if you have local fossil clubs, don't don't be afraid, you know, no matter what stage you're in, if you're in middle school, if you're in high school, any age, um, reach out to people and try to get experiences where you can go collect fossils or study fossils or just ask the advice of a professional who's working in the field. I think our community is really welcoming. That's one of the things I love about it. And so hearing from folks who are excited about the field is always a wonderful thing. Yeah, that is really exciting. Um, Dr. Visaji, I'm gonna stay with you for a second. We have a question. What fossil, um, you mentioned you, you found a fossil when you were young. So what fossil did you find when you were five years old? I found a brachiopod, which is similar in appearance to a clam. There, there are some differences, but if you don't know what a brachiopod is, it kind of looks like a clam. It has two halves of a shell. And they used to be really, really popular hundreds of millions of years ago. We still have them today but they're a lot less common now. And I still do have that fossil. My mom actually uh, gave it to me for Christmas a few years ago. So uh, it's really fun to still have the fossil that inspired my interest initially. That's really cool. <laughs> I also started a rock collection when I was very young on, and fossils and, and still have very much a, a lot of rocks around me, which people don't, don't encourage when I have to move, <laughs> I have to move them. They're not really fond of moving rocks. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, Dr. Cohen, being a, a female 
paleontologist, did men ever tell you you couldn't achieve your goal because you were a girl? Mm. So um, I was fortunate in that I never had anyone explicitly tell me that. Um, and, uh, you know, I um, thank the, you know, the wonderful science teachers that I had in my K-12 uh, life. And then also, um, you know, Warren was my paleontology professor and he was uh, nothing but encouraging uh, and, and still is to this day. Um, but I would say that there were definitely situations in my education and in my career where um, it was more of like an undercurrent of feeling like I didn't belong or I wasn't, um, you know, good enough or smart enough or couldn't hike as fast um, as as the men could. So for me, it was more an experience um, of, yeah, I guess, I, like I said, sort of an undercurrent as opposed to um, explicitly being told that I didn't belong. And that can be almost as hard because sometimes it's hard to know, um, uh, hard to sort of trust yourself and trust your instincts in, the, in those situations. Yeah, that undercurrent can be something that just continues to tug on you, correct? Yeah, exactly. And I think coming back to this idea of mentors and community, I think one of the ways that I overcame that was by talking to other women who were having the same experience and, and sort of realizing like, oh, wait a second, you know, this isn't just me. This is something bigger than me. Um, you know, Christy is a great example. Like we've known each other since we were students and we've definitely had conversations where it's been like, is this all in my head? No, no, it's not all in your head. So I think, again, finding community um, and finding mentors at different levels, whether they be peer mentors or, or mentors who are older than you, is a really critical part of, of finding your place and, and, and creating a sense of belonging for yourself in paleontology. Oh, yeah, that's, that's absolutely great uh, advice. I'd like to actually um, go to Dr. Visaji. Can you also comment on that, you know, being a female paleontologist, did you ever hear uh, men telling you you couldn't achieve your goal because you were a girl? So early on, uh, I never had that experience. Um, there was never a time in K-12 where I thought that. I really think it was only as I progressed in my career uh, that, again, kind of like Phoebe said, for the most part, it was more of an undercurrent. There was the rare occasion where somebody said, do you want a career or do you want to have babies? Uh, I, I do remember that vividly. But, um, well, I have a career and I have babies, so take that. Um, <laughs> but as Phoebe said, the having community has been really important, uh, both my peers, as well as wonderful mentors like Dr. Ivany, also a panelist tonight. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Hermsen, Hermsen, excuse me, the, the same question, because I think this is important, you know, uh, coming up against those barriers and being told, you know, that either you're not good or you're not welcome in this field, you know, did you experience that as well? Um, I wouldn't say I did, definitely not as a student. Uh, you know, I got a lot of support from my parents in pursuing science. And um, when I was young, we went camping a lot and stuff. So I never had this idea that I couldn't be in the outdoors or I couldn't go hiking or, you know, we'd go fishing and stuff. Um, that all seemed very normal to me. So I would say no. I would say, if anything, the difficulties have come more as I've progress to becoming more senior in my career. And also for me, especially because I'm married to another paleontologist, which can make it really difficult to sort of navigate around two careers, if you will. I bet that becomes challenging, especially, you know, with travel. Uh, with travel, with trying to find jobs in the same place. Um, we actually, lived in different states for a very long time. For a while, I was in Ohio and he was in California. So that was very challenging, yeah. And Dr. Ivany, can you also um, give us your perspective on this question? Did you come up against this bar barrier where you felt like you didn't have a space in paleontology because of being a woman? Yeah, so uh, I went through the system a little earlier than everybody else, and so, um, uh, I, I don't think I had quite the benefit of um, having quite as many women around at the time. 
So things were a little more interesting. <laughs> uh, I won't go into details. Um, I can say though that um, when I was younger in, in grade school and high school, I had tremendous amounts of support. It never even occurred to me that there was an issue of boys versus girls. It was just nothing. I was, I was totally supported in that regard. Um, uh, I, I do recall once I got into college again, it was super supportive, but my very first professional conference that I ever went to, I was told by some uh, eminent male scholars <clears throat> that, um, well, women don't go into geology and paleontology unless they're ugly or they want a husband. So you're not ugly. So do you want to go get a drink? <laughs> Literally, that's cool. Um, so that was an interesting experience. And I was, I thought this guy's on another planet or something. Um, so we all have these little war stories and there, there's more interesting ones that I won't go into now, but, um, but I think I had the benefit from uh, the women, the relatively few, but you know, certainly there are women that went through the system before me and had laid the groundwork and had changed the system already. And I'm sort of hoping that the people in my generation have made the, the pavement just a little bit easier for everybody else subsequently to navigate. Um, I guess I still feel like I'm, I you know, just echo the same things that everybody else has just said. I think there is sort of this undercurrent that you're never quite part of the crowd, part of the in crowd, the group. You know, there's always just a little bit of a sense of, you know, being an outsider here and um, and not being quite comfortable about whether you're to trust yourself that that, in fact, is real or if you're, you're just you know imagining things. So that can be a little bit difficult. But I think by and large, um, you know, the other folks are, are absolutely right. There's a really strong community of women out there in paleontology and, and women and men both who are super supportive of, of everybody that wants to get into the field. And so you know, find some people like that and uh, connect with them, make them part of your circle. That was great, thank you. I wanna stay kind of on this thread for a moment. Um, so I am going to ask all of you this similar question because I think there's uh, a lot to say about it. So what was your biggest obstacle in getting to where you are today? Um, and why don't we go ahead and uh, start with Dr. Ivany? Yeah, boy. Um biggest obstacle, I guess, uh, probably myself, I have to admit, <laughs> just my own confidence that I am, in fact, able to do this in terms of, um, you know, being welcome in the field and, and feeling like I'm, I'm confident enough to do it. Um, so for me, that was probably the biggest thing. Uh, it's just sort of getting it in my head, my, getting through my own head, that in fact, uh, I was part of this, that I could actually do it. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Visaji? The first thing that came to mind when you asked that question was this time period in between my master's and my PhD, where I was trying to navigate multiple aspects of my life. I had um, a relationship with the man who is now my husband, and I wanted to move across the country and be with him. I had my family in New Jersey who very much wanted me to stay on the East Coast. And I had to decide about looking for jobs and internships in my PhD. And uh, there were some really, really challenging times in trying to navigate all that and being able to pursue what I wanted to do. Fortunately, I ended up landing a National Park Service internship that allowed me to kind of keep my toes in paleontology while I was figuring things out. And then I later returned to school for my PhD. But that was a really big obstacle because it was a, a very difficult time to try to navigate all the different aspects of my life at once. And that's the reality, right? You know, not everybody's path is a straight path. It's often crooked and goes in, in different ways. Uh, Dr. Hermsen, uh, what was your biggest obstacle in getting where you are today? Um, well, I think I kind of brought it up already. Uh, I got married in grad school. And my husband was uh, now husband was uh, in a program in paleontology as well. So everything post grad school, we've been trying to find a way to be in the same place. And we lucked out when um, we both managed to get postdocs in Kansas. But after that, for a very long period of time, we weren't both able to find jobs in the field in the same area. So he got a job in California. I ended up in New York. Then I was in Ohio. Then he was in New York. Finally, now we're both at PRI, but it took a long time for us to get here. So um, there was just a lot of juggling and a lot of different time zones and navigating a long distance relationship involved. And that's definitely very challenging. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cohen? Sure. Yeah. So um, 
for me, a little bit what Linda said, I think I, I was my biggest barrier. And for me, my, my sort of crisis of confidence was at the end of graduate school. I had some really difficult sort of scientific um, interactions and dynamics and challenges at the end of my PhD program that made me doubt whether or not I was sort of cut out for uh, academia, cut out to be a, a, a researcher, um, and whether or not it would be sort of better or easier for me to take another path. Um, and so I kind of, you know, I, I took one foot out of the, or one, I had one foot in, one foot out, sort of like what Christy was saying. Um, and it was, again, my community, um, my collaborators, my friends, my colleagues in the field um, who really helped me see that I did have a place in paleontology and that um, I could do it. And and they were right. And uh, here I am. So. Well, and we're glad you're here. Uh, we have a question from our audience member for Dr. Ivany. Um, this person is interested in geology and paleontology, and they are curious, how does your research correlate with both? Geology and paleontology. Well, I, I guess I'm interested in uh, the ancient earth and how the earth's surface, including life, has changed over time. So, you know, um, to be able to understand what's going on in the fossil record, you really have to be a solid geologist to try and interpret the environment in which these things are, are, are being found. Um, so, you know, fossils are coming out of rocks and, and those rocks are telling you about the ancient Earth's surface. So if you don't understand the rocks, the geologic context for your fossils, then yeah, you're, you're missing some stuff. So for me, um, geology and paleontology are just interwoven. It's like people ask me if I'm a geologist or a paleontologist. Well, I'm, I'm both. I don't know how to disentangle those two things. Um, I think that doesn't necessarily have to be true depending on the flavor of paleontology you want to do. But uh, at least for my own work, I'm very much interested in the evolution of the Earth system, um, the Earth's surface environments and organisms and how they are affecting each other. And so you know, for me, I really do need to have both, um, you know, both fields of expertise has to have to come to bear on this. Thank you. I have a question I'm going to toss out to the group um, to see which of you wants to answer this one. We had an audience question about how do you think we can best incorporate paleontology into elementary schools? I can uh, chime in to start. I'm sure others will as well. But if you are a teacher who's asking that question, there are numerous standards uh, in biology, especially also in earth science, like in sixth grade, where you can talk about fossils. And fossils, I believe, in third grade is usually when they're introduced as a concept. There is a resource called Fossil Use Cards, and I can share the link uh, with the organizers so they can share it with everybody. And I was part of this project for the Paleontological Society, and what we did was we looked at how fossils have been used by humans uh, through time as well as now. But the reason I bring it up is because we provide a list of the next generation science standards. And so these are the standards that many of the teachers use in K-12 to teach their courses and all of the ones that are relevant to the resource that we provide. So if teachers are looking for a way to incorporate fossils into different lessons, that could be a great start to look at uh, some of the standards and how to incorporate fossils in those lessons. That is great. Thank you so much. Uh, does somebody want to add on to, um, okay, Dr. Cohen. Yeah, there are also programs like Skype a Scientist um, where teachers can request a paleontologist or another scientist um, Skype, who uses Skype, <laughs> Zoom or Skype into their classroom um, and do a, a Q&A. Um, and so that can be a great opportunity to sort of like this event to um, have a chance to talk to a scientist or a, someone who's still in graduate school um, who can talk to your students about paleontology. Um, I've also done class visits for local schools, um, and I know many of us do that as well. So reaching out to local colleges or universities or fossil clubs. Um, so there's, a, you know, a, a, in some parts of the country, a lot of avocational paleontologists, so people who um, are, do it as a very serious hobby. Um, and those groups often will also be really happy to come and, um, and do events at uh, elementary schools as well. Great, thank you so much. 
Dr. Hermsen, do you have anything to add additionally? Uh, I don't know. A lot of good things have been brought up. I'd say, um, I guess another good thing to do is, is to get out and get hands on and look for fossils. If you have an area where you can, can go out and uh, do a field trip or it, um, if you have a child in your life and uh, you can take them out, just go out and look. Some uh, some states like Ohio have fossil parks where you can actually go out and collect. And there are sometimes uh, private areas where you can go and collect. Um, obviously, if you're collecting anywhere, you want to know the rules of, the, of the, the land or who the landowner is. So you know you have permission to collect. But um, I think that's a way to get people interested. And I think that's actually a way a, a lot of people get interested in paleontology. Thank you so much. Um, this question is for everybody. I think uh, Dr. Her Dr. Hermsen's already touched on this a little bit, but how much do you travel and or move for your research and your job? Dr. Ivody, do you want to kick us off? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I guess from my, my own perspective, I, I probably traveled a whole lot more earlier on in my career than I'm doing now. And that's just because of where I'm at in my life right now. And, and, and it's a little bit more difficult to travel. Um, I think a lot of paleontologists get into it because of the field work, um, because it's exciting and fun and you can go to these cool places and sort of the thrill of discovery of fossils. But it's also true that an awful lot of really cool paleontology is done you know, it, right in your in your office, you don't have to actually go out. There's all sorts of really great databases that you can use, and you can do a lot of a lot of work with museum specimens as well. So it really kind of depends on you know what floats your own boat, right? And what 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 makes you excited about these things. Um, certainly, the potential is there to do a lot of great travel associated with it. I'm sure you know, like Tr Christy, for example, I'm sure has lots of good stories to tell about field work as well. Um, but there's a lot you can do in the lab as well that doesn't require field work. So it really is you know whatever you decide is most important and interesting to you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, let's go to Dr. Abasaji. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think it is true that a lot of us enjoy being outdoors and, um, <laughs> you know, looking for fossils and, and being out there. But the reality is that's only maybe a few weeks out of the year that I do that. You know, teaching is my passion. So I am more often in the classroom or behind a computer doing a lot of the work on fossils. And actually, I've uh, pivoted a little bit during the pandemic in not being able to travel and started to work on modern land snails and slugs because I can't go out and collect my fossil uh, samples as easily with the travel restrictions. So I've found a, a way to do science with my students locally outdoors, which has been really fun. And there was one more thing I was going to add, and I can't remember what it is. So <laughs> maybe come back to me. <laughs> you got it. Uh, I love how you you know were able to pivot and still keep that research and that wonder going. But uh, yeah, with the travel restrictions, that does slow slow some of that down. Uh, oh, I remembered. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know how important it is, but uh, I would say also that when I was a graduate student and earlier in my career, I did travel a lot more. But now I have uh, two wonderful young children ages four and six. And so that has certainly factored into my decisions to ease up a little bit on the traveling and do more of the local exploration. And then hopefully when they're older, I can bring them back out into the, the field more. Although when they were, they were babies, I put them in a wrap and we went out to the field or went to the conference. So just know that you can do those kinds of things too. That's great advice. Yeah, because you can absolutely take, take them with you. Uh, Dr. Cohen. Sure. Yeah. So I've um, gotten to travel all over the world um, as a paleontologist, which has definitely been a super exciting part of my career. But as as Linda said, you know, and as Christy pointed out, the ratio of sort of travel to lab work and computer work is is um, you know it's pretty low. So I you know maybe a week or two of field work and travel, and then lots and lots of time in the lab um, in front of my computer trying to understand what it all means. Um, in terms of moving for my career, I've been very lucky in that I haven't gone very far. <laughs> um, I grew up in the Boston area. I went to Cornell. I went back to the Boston area for grad school, and now I'm in Western Massachusetts. But I would say that's um, I'm an anomaly. I think most people end up having to move um, more often further away 
um, to pursue different types of research opportunities and jobs, which can definitely be a hard part of the job. And, and, and Liz discussed that earlier as well. Um, but the, the travel is great. Um, and for me, it's sort of like a, a perk of the job. Um, but definitely it's not like I'm, you know, gone four or five months out of the year or anything like that. And I also have a young kid, so that's definitely impacted my, um, my work travel as well. Thank you. It actually leads us right into our next audience question. Um, when you do your field work and have a family, can you bring your family along and get them involved in your research? Um, so Dr. Hermson, can you start us off with that? Um, well, it's a good question. I actually do not have children. Um, and I usually do my field work on my own in terms of, or well, with a research group, not with family. Um, in terms of whether you could bring your family, I think it probably really depends on the uh, maybe age of your children, on where your field site is, on how expensive it is to travel there. There are probably a lot of factors that um, maybe Phoebe and, and Christy can speak to a little bit better, or Linda. Yeah, Dr. Ivney, do you want to take this? Um, sure. I'm, I'm, in, I'm also in the same boat in that I don't have kids. And so it's a little bit easier for me uh, in terms of traveling. I do know that um, I have a number of wonderful colleagues who are outstanding scientists who have kids, several of whom are on this call. Um, and, uh, and many of them have found ways to, to bring their kids out in the field. So um, we can certainly hear a lot more about that, I'm sure. Um, depends on where you are, right? I mean, and where, and where you're going. Like, so for example, I, I did a lot of field work in Antarctica and that's, that's a little bit harder. <laughs> I think if I had kids, I would not have been able to bring them there clearly. But, um, but other places, yeah, you can definitely navigate that system and figure out you know, you know, ways to do it as long as you're safe, yeah. Great, thank you. Dr. Vasaji? Yeah, so I have brought my kids uh, with me to the Bahamas. I have um, had them come look for fossils with me locally in the southeastern U.S. They absolutely helped a lot after virtual kindergarten with looking for modern snails and slugs. They're much better at it. They're closer to the ground and they notice these things. So uh, it's been really great to involve them in field work. I think there's other field experiences I've had where it really wasn't quite the right situation to bring them along, but it is nice to know that there are some times when everybody can participate. Thank you. And Dr. Cohen, did you want to add anything to that? I mean, you already touched about how you take your your um, your kids with you, which is great. Yeah. So I, um, my son is four and he has not done field work with me yet, in part because I haven't done very much because of the pandemic, um, and in part because some of my field work is really remote in places sort of um, like what Linda was talking about, where it wouldn't be safe to have a kid with you. Um, but I'm definitely excited about bringing him with me as he gets older. He already knows how to identify different kinds of fossils. Like you, we have lots of rocks and fossils around the house. Um, he loves to hike. And so I'm excited to uh, maybe try to bring him along as he gets older. I've definitely been on Dunfield work with colleagues who have brought their kids with them. Um, and it's actually been really fun. Um, and I have other colleagues who, you know, whose kids have been a part of their their field work for their entire lives. And now their kids are are in college and pursuing um, pursuing science degrees. So that's really cool to see too that, you know, um, that you can make it work and you can find ways to incorporate your family into your work. That's great. Thank you. Uh, we have a question looking for some advice. This sounds like a person who has found paleontology their passion for that later in life. Um, and do you feel that there's ever a time where it's too late to change your careers or that age would be a barrier for going into paleontology? Who would like to start us off? I, I, I think you start. Can... Oh, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> please. Um, I've had several colleagues who, you know, didn't find their passion for paleontology until much later in in their life, um, you know, 40s, 50s, and beyond. And they went back to school and they, you know, found ways in which they could pursue this as a profession. So I, I don't think that there's ever a time in which it's too late to pursue that. And there's also many different ways to pursue paleontology, you know, work in a museum or as uh, Dr. Cohen mentioned, there are a lot of avocational paleontologists. So even if you know, your situation is such that you can't turn it into a new profession. Uh, there's other ways to get really involved and be able to regularly contribute to the discipline. 
Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ivany, did you want to add on to that? Yeah, I'll just I'll just echo the same thing. There's a lot of ways that you can get involved. It's never too late, um, even quite late in your in a career. And so, um, you know, I know uh, a number of people now that have um, gotten involved, especially with museums and collections and volunteering in collections. It's a great way to get started and get you know get get your feet wet in the in the field. Um, I also have a number of colleagues who um, are now um, you know. A, uh, supporting a department, for example, where there is paleontological research being done and basically um, you know, going to seminars and contributing at various levels and, and learning a whole lot at, at the same time. And, you know, these are people, you know, that are like, you know, 82, for example, you know, so they've, you know, they're, they're coming at it a little bit later in life, but it's certainly um, a rewarding experience. You can learn a whole heck of a lot and make some significant contributions at that level too. So it's never too late. I love that advice. We have a question from Evelyn. Um, As a high schooler, I would love to start a paleontology and fossil club at my school. Any advice or resources that I could use? Uh, Dr. Uh, Hermsen, do you wanna start us off? Wow. Um, Yeah, I I think it sort of maybe depends on where you are. Um, You might be able to uh, kind of connect with an amateur fossil club in your area. There are some that are very active and they may be able to help you out with local resources or maybe even fossil collecting trips. Um, Yeah, you can, I I guess you can look for regional resources as well. Um, We mentioned the digital atlases, but uh, national parks, state parks may have information on paleontology in in specific regions. Um, I guess it kind of depends on what you want to do. Learn about paleontology or collect or, or whatever it is. Dr. Cohen, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would just echo um, finding local resources, again, connecting with local museums, with local um, fossil clubs if they exist, um, and um, check out the links that are being posted in the comments. There's a lot of different resources. Uh, Christy has has mentioned the Fossil Project, which is a network of avocational paleontologists and paleontology fossil clubs. Um, there's uh, the Encyclopedia of, of um ancient life that, that Liz mentioned. So I think there's a lot of online resources um, and then places that you can connect in person like museums um, and clubs. Mm-hmm. That's great, thank you. And we have um, several links that are also in the chat for you with taking you back to a lot of the, the comments that our panelists have mentioned. Uh, so we have a question. Um, how did you decide what organism or organisms to specialize in? Uh, so I'm going to start with Dr. Ivany. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. I guess for me, I've, I, I don't have a particular affinity for one organism over another. I just, for me, it's like, what's the question? If the question's interesting, exciting, that's good enough. You know, so I've worked on things from, you know, fossil seagrasses or plants, and I've worked on fossil whales, things with backbones. Um, most of what I work on are invertebrates these days. And okay, it, admittedly, I am rather fond of mollusks. That is true. Clams and snails and, and squids and their relatives. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. For me, it's it's always about the questions you can ask with those fossils, with those organisms. And if the question is an exciting one and a compelling one, it doesn't really matter to me what the animal is or plant or microfossil is. Um, there's some outstanding work that's being done there across the whole kingdom of, you know, well, everything. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, there's, um, there's a lot you can do. I'm not, there's not a particular group for me. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cohen? Yeah, so I work on tiny fossils. Um, and so there are all different kinds of, of microscopic fossils, but I really love microscopy. I love seeing the unseen. I love um, discovering that, you know, a, just a boring old rock that has nothing on the outside is actually full of you know hundreds of microscopic fossils that can tell us just a huge amount about um, past life on Earth. So for me, it's that that's part of it that gets me really excited. I did a lot of photography um, as a teenager and in college, and so microscopes and taking pictures with you know electron microscopes of of really microscopic things is um, one of my favorite parts of my job. And so um, I think that love of photography and love of sort of the hidden or secret parts of the fossil record is what got me excited about working on on microfossils or tiny fossils. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hermsen? 
Yeah, so um, I work on plants. I got really into plants in high school. We did a herbarium project where we got uh, credit for each plant we collected and different families and different genera and different species. So then I had to go out and learn how to um, identify all these different plants. Uh, so that probably sparked my interest in, in focusing on plants as a study organism. Um, yeah, and, and uh, I've worked on a lot of different time periods, a lot of different styles of preservation. Uh, right now, one of my projects is looking a lot at, at fruits and seeds, and these are very small fossils as well. So I do use um, a lot of microscopy in my work. Um, but yeah, I just actually really like plants. So that's why I work on them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good reason. Uh, Dr. Visaji, can you finish us out? I have always had a fondness for uh, marine vertebrates, so things without a backbone, your brachiopods, clams, snails, crabs, things like that. Uh, the marine realm in particular, I've always really uh, enjoyed marine ecosystems. And I think a lot of my interest in mollusks, which is what I've been studying for uh, about 20 years now, is because of that initial interest in marine life and trying to decide, do I want to pursue geology? Do I want to pursue marine biology? And I think mollusks kind of have made the best fit for being able to do that, both in using modern organisms to help understand questions in the fossil record, as well as studying fossils, and maybe thinking about what that can tell us as we approach conservation problems today. I just love how versatile they are. You can look at predator-prey interactions. You can find out information about past environments and climate and seawater chemistry. You can study uh, how communities have changed through time. And they're just so abundant because they have those hard shells that preserve really nicely. So I just, uh, I, I love my snails and clams. Well, what's not to love there, right? <laughs> Um, I have a question that I'm gonna toss out to the group. Um, universities and museums have large collections of fossils for researchers to study that are not on display for the general public. Um, do you ever use those collections in your research and how do you, how do you find them? Um, Dr. Hermsen, can we start with you? Yeah, actually I use a lot of collections in my research. Um, so right now, one of my main projects is, is with Gray Fossil Site in Tennessee. And uh, this is a fossil site. It preserves sort of this ancient lake deposit that formed in a sinkhole. And um, there's actually a museum on the site and they have volunteers in that, that that excavate the fossils and process all the fossils. So I go down there to just choose things that I wanna work on. And um, a few times I've gone down for a few days to, you know, maybe five days or something just to sort through the collections and look at things. Um, another project that I'm involved in uh, is, is based in Argentina. And um, we work a lot with the museum down there that houses the collections and also helps uh, provide the logistics for field work. So yeah, collections work, um, both fossil collections, but also herbarium work because there are herbaria that store uh, modern dried plants uh, as well are really important to my research. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ivany. Yeah, I'll just I'll just jump in there as well. Uh, you know, museum collections are so incredibly important to maintain and to have around. Um, you know, especially for paleontology. Um, so you know, a couple of really obvious things that might be important is that you know they're they're housing collections of material that might be really valuable from places, for example, that are no longer accessible or not even don't even exist anymore. Things have been completely paved over or destroyed in the process. So, um, you know, museums are really the only place you can get to that material now at all. And so really, really important to be able to do that. Um, it's also really important to be able to access fossils from places that are not um, easily accessible today. So, for example, I work in Antarctica and work on Antarctic fossils. And yes, I've been down there several times and I have my own material that I've brought back. But, but boy, you can't collect everything that you're ever going to need. And so having other resources around, museum collections around, for example, like at the Paleontological Research Institution, they have a really important collection of material from Antarctica that was amassed over many, many years of field work. Um, there's no way I could ever do that in one field season. And so having that available and accessible is just incredibly important. So, yeah, museums are really vital resources. 
Thank you. Um, so we have a question. What degrees do you recommend for a paleontology career? Uh, Dr. Fasaji, do you want to comment on that? Yeah. Um, I think most paleontologists either choose geology or biology or zoology, some one or the other, or maybe both, or having a major and a minor. I think it's really important that initially paleontologists get experience in kind of both areas because you need to study the life, but also the contexts in which they were found. And then typically what happens is uh, you might end up pursuing more geology or more of the biology, zoology, depending on the type of paleontology that you study. I'm an ecologist. I study organisms and how they interact with their environment and with each other. So I actually did my first two degrees in geology and then my PhD in marine biology so I could kind of get the best of both worlds. Great, thank you. And I know that so many of you have um, a varied background. Dr. Cohen, do you wanna comment on that? Yeah, a lot of it depends on the, the specialty or the area of paleontology that you're interested in. Um, so my um, undergraduate degree is in earth system science, which was an interdisciplinary um, earth science major at Cornell. So I never took a lot of the sort of traditional geology courses. And I often tell my students this because um, I'm a professor in a geology department, um, and a lot of that I learned along the way. And so I think one thing to, re to remember is that um, like all the choices that Christy just outlined, there are many different paths to becoming a paleontologist. And, um, you know, just because maybe you were a geology major and didn't take a lot of, you know, biology or vice versa, doesn't mean that you can't progress in the field. Um, and so a lot of what we learn, um, we learn sort of on the job or we learn um, in, um, in the course of doing our research. Uh, so I think whatever track you you start on, um, whether it be more biology focused or more geology focused, um, can still lead you to a career in paleontology. And um, in my experience, at least people who work on vertebrates, so dinosaurs and mammals and things like that tend to have more of a biology background. Um, people who work on invertebrates tend to have more of a geology background, but that's definitely not universal. And there's certainly exceptions to um, all of those. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we do have a few more questions that are coming in. So if you do have questions, please do ask them in the chat so we can get to them. Um, are paleontologist jobs limited to academia and or museums? Can you get jobs outside of these realms? Um, Dr. Visaji, let's start with you. Um, sure, one thing that comes to mind and then maybe I'll uh, toss it to Phoebe because she looked like she wanted to say something is there is paleontological consulting. So there are certain uh, places, California is one example, where as part of new development and construction, they want to make sure that they're not destroying important fossil resources and that they're properly observed and excavated if need be. So I, I know several people who have worked kind of in, in that realm. Uh, another thing that comes to mind is in uh, kind of federal agency work. So the USGS, the United States Geological Survey, or the National Park Service. And there's different ways in which people hold jobs related to paleontology in that regard. Some are doing more research, some are doing more management of fossil resources, and others are doing education. So those are just a few examples, but there's more that I'll uh, let Dr. Cohen share. Well, Christy uh, mentioned a lot of them, but the reason I was eager to raise my hand is because I just ran a um, careers and mentoring event a couple of weeks ago for college students and graduate students in paleontology in my role in the Paleontological Society. So that's another resource we haven't mentioned yet, it's the Professional Society of Paleontologists. Um, and it's mostly geared, geared towards academic paleontologists and students, um, but definitely has a lot of resources for everybody as well. Um, and in that career panel, yeah, I had someone who worked for like the company that Christy just mentioned, who does um, contract paleontology. We had a science writer, um, Riley Black, um, who writes books about paleontology and also does field work. Um, people who teach at all different levels from uh, high school to college, community college, people who work in museums in many different roles, um, from curation to exhibit design and education. Um, the Park Service, like Christy mentioned, and other government agencies. I also have friends who have 
um, advanced degrees in paleontology who have gone on to do science journalism, um, investigative reporting, um, and policy work. So there is some really great programs for scientists after you get a PhD to go into sort of science policy work and, and work um, in Washington, D.C. Um, for Congress. Great. Well, thank you. Yeah, that sounds like there's lots of avenues to explore with a paleontology degree. Um, I think we're going to wrap up with this question, and I'm going to ask everybody to, to comment on this. Uh, what do you think are the most effective ways to attract girls and young women in careers in STEM? Uh, Dr. Cohen, do you want to go ahead and start with? So this is always a tricky question because I don't think we actually have to work to attract girls and women in STEM. I think they're already interested. Um, I mean, obviously, if you're a parent, um, exposing your kids to all sorts of different you know, areas of science is really wonderful, taking them to museums, you know, buying them different kinds of books that, um, like the Daring to Dig book that shows women in paleontology is great. But there's a lot of women and girls who are interested in paleontology. And so um, as a college professor, I really see my job as making sure that the students who show up interested stay interested and have a positive experience. Um, and this comes back to those early comments about, you know, potential like sexism that some of us may have faced early um, in different stages in our career. So for me, it's really about making paleontology a place where women and girls feel comfortable, feel safe, and feel supported um, in pursuing their interests. Um, and that's what I'm really focused on. Thank you. Dr. Ivany? I'm just going to echo what Phoebe just said. I think that you know, she put it beautifully. I think retention is probably more of an issue than, than getting people excited about it to begin with. Um, yeah. Uh, what else could I suggest? <laughs> I think that's about right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hermson or Dr. Visaji, do you have anything you want to add? Um, I think Phoebe's comments covered it very well. Uh, girls are interested, and I think that the important thing is to try to support their interests and um, to try to find ways to retain them, you know, as they get older and further along and may face more obstacles and barriers to staying in science. And I would uh, echo all of that that everybody said, uh, but to be more explicit, to reiterate a point that was mentioned earlier is finding mentors uh, and finding, you know, peer mentors and mentors who are farther along in their career than you. I had the good fortune to have three women mentors for each of my degrees. I also had some amazing uh, male colleagues who supported me, but it's been really great to have uh, those women mentors in my professional space, as well as other grad students at the time when I was in school, or now other colleagues at my institution who are women. And I think building that, that network, you know, can never start too early. So finding those supportive people in your community is really valuable. It definitely is. Um, we do have an audience question that is pretty specific. Uh, so I'm going to read it and then um, ask who might want to field this one. So between biology and geology, which would paleontologists who specialize in 3D printing and biomechanics major? Uh, they also added also paleo artists question. Yeah, I would say biology um, because you really need to understand you know, the physiology of vertebrates for that kind of work, right? Like how vertebrates are built and how they work. And I think for, for that, you need to make sure that you're at a school that offers those kinds of courses, because a lot of biology departments um, are more focused on like molecular or cellular biology and genetics, which is, which is great. Um, but making sure that you um, are at a, at a school or institution that um, has courses in, you know, vertebrate anatomy, human anatomy, things like that, that would provide you those opportunities um, to learn more about how, you know, organisms are built and bones. Yeah. Thank you. Does anybody else want to comment on that? Dr. Ivany? No, sounds about right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say bio. Phoebe had it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I would like to thank our panelists this evening, paleobotanist and research scientist at the Paleontological Research Institution, Dr. Elizabeth Hermson, 
I would like to thank, thank Professor you. and Associate Chair of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Syracuse University, Dr. Linda Ivany. Undergraduate Program Director in Geosciences at Georgia State University, Dr. Christy Basaji. Thank you. And Associate Professor of Geosciences at Williams College in Massachusetts, Dr. Phoebe Cohen. Thank you. This panel is a complement to the exhibit Daring to Dig, Women in American Paleontology on display at the Museum of the Earth in Ithaca, New York until December, 2021. It is also available online at daringtodig.org. This event will be archived and available to view on WSKG's YouTube channel. Thank you to the Paleontological Research Institution and its Museum of the Earth. I wanna thank our team here at WSKG, Jackie Stapleton-Durham, Patrick Holmes, and Alyssa Micha. I'm your host, Nancy Coddington. Thank you for joining us and good night. <laughs>